This lecture is about the basics of LED lighting. LEDs have their roots in science that goes back over a hundred years. In 1907, the British scientist Henry Round discovered electroluminescence. He noticed that inorganic matter, when subjected to a direct current, starts to glow in different colors. Round was satisfied with publishing his discovery in the British journal Electrical World, but he didn't bother investigating it any further. Later, in 1921, the Russian scientist and engineer Oleg Losev rediscovered it independently. He reported the creation of the first visible light LED in 1927 in the Russian journal Wireless Telegraphy and Telephony. But as things often go in the history of technology, also the second precursor of the modern-day LED was soon forgotten. This lecture has five parts. By the end of it, you'll be able to start designing the luminaire for this course project. Part 1. What is light? Part 2. How can you measure and evaluate light? Part 3. How did lamps and LEDs develop through history? Part 4. What are the pros and cons of using LEDs? Part 5. How do LEDs work and how do you select the components to drive them? Part 1. What is light? Light is just a particular form of energy. It is visible electromagnetic radiation, a very small part of the spectrum ranging from short wave radiation, shown on the left of all charts, to long wave radiation shown on the right. Some animals can even see in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. They literally see the world in a different light, seeing things you cannot see. Lamp manufacturers have always tried to mimic the full spectrum of natural daylight, more or less successfully as the charts show. You notice that in daylight fluorescent lamps and compact fluorescent lamps, also known as energy-saving light bulbs, some wavelengths are boosted to deliver a more pleasing light impression. However, that is cheating because local spikes and large gaps in a lamp's emission spectrum are a strain on the eye, or rather on the visual cortex, the brain region that makes you think you can see. Looking at the charts, it is clear that the energy-saving light bulb was a visually poor and unsustainable stopgap solution. Let's look a bit more in detail at the spectrum of a high-quality white lighting LED. You notice there is always a spike in the blue region of the spectrum. You can also see that the blue spike is reduced as much as possible to achieve lower color temperatures. But with current LED phosphor chemistry, it doesn't disappear entirely. Just how to eliminate the spectrum valley in the 480 nanometer region is the big challenge in LED research. Part 2. How can you measure and evaluate light? You have five quantifications, that means properties that let you consider the utility value of any lamp for the task you are designing for. The lumen value is probably easiest to understand. It specifies a lamp's total visible light output per unit of time, but that tells you nothing about its perceived brightness or directionality. You can measure a lamp's lumens with a special laboratory device known as integrating sphere. Unfortunately, this is a task you can't easily try for yourself. Instead, you have to trust the specifications provided by a lamp's manufacturer. The lux value specifies the intensity of light that is falling onto a surface or passing through it, which is particularly important for public, medical or task lighting. The law of decay, the so-called inverse square law, is a fundamental concept in physics, not only for the dilution of light as it passes through space, but also many other phenomena like gravity or electrostatics. Inverse square means that a quantity or intensity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from its source. You can measure the lux value at a surface with a photometer, a device calibrated to the human eye's spectral daylight sensitivity. The candela value specifies a lamp's perceived brightness in a particular direction but tells you nothing about the total light output or illumination. You can calculate a lamp's candela value from the lumen output and radiation angle shown on the manufacturer's specification sheet. More accurately, you could measure it in a laboratory with a gonio photometer that is swept over the entire lamp's radiation angle at exactly one meter distance. Apart from the three basic units you just learned about, 
You must also consider the color of light emitted, known as a lamp's correlated color temperature, CCT. Physiologically, one can say that warmer light promotes relaxation, while cooler light enhances concentration. This aspect is fairly important as the trend in lighting goes clearly towards human-centric lighting. That means considering day and night, active and passive periods, and our individual circadian rhythms. While mixing color temperatures with different LEDs sounds very good on paper, research has shown it is not without problems. But one thing is certain, in the future, giving the user the option to adjust a lamp's color temperature, as well as emission dynamics, will become standard. And finally, you need to consider a lamp's color rendering index, CRI. It is a measure of a lamp's capability to faithfully reveal the colors of objects, in comparison to an ideal or natural light source. The more continuous a lamp's emission spectrum, the higher its color rendering index. A high CRI means that a lamp performs well in relation to the first eight test color samples shown here. But that standard is under much discussion in lighting and may well change in the future. If a lamp has gaps or valleys in its emission spectrum, color shifts will occur, because radiation that is not emitted by a lamp in the first place cannot be reflected from what is illuminated. For a flashlight or emergency lighting, you may be satisfied with a highly efficient, low-cost, low-CRI LED, while for use in an operating theater or office space, the requirement would be much different. In other words, you must always consider the use case for the luminaire you are designing. Part 3. How did lamps and LEDs develop through history? Now this is really a huge topic, so please try visiting a museum of electricity or science to see firsthand just how much the technology and design of lamps have changed over time. LEDs have a long history too, from their humble beginnings as dimly lit indicators to all-purpose retrofit light sources. The first practically usable visible light LED was prototyped in 1962 by Nick Holoniak, an engineer with General Electric. Not much later, in 1968, the Monsanto company became the first commercial mass producer of LEDs, first only in red, but then also in green and orange. Red, green and orange were soon offered by many manufacturers. They eventually became commonplace as indicators for user interfaces in all kinds of industries. Finally, after many years of research, Shuji Nakamura of Nikia Corporation demonstrated the first blue high-brightness LED in 1993. The color blue, so hard to obtain, was essential to develop white LEDs for lighting applications. It's not surprising that in 2014, Nakamura was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for having enabled the LED lighting revolution. Part 4 what are the pros and cons of using LEDs? The major advantage of LEDs is their reduced environmental impact. That means efficient use of power, less embodied production energy, and a substantial reduction of processed raw materials. When you compare LEDs to other light sources, their enormous sustainability benefits are obvious. Compared to any other lamp, Chip on board LEDs use the least amount of energy and raw materials in production. They have by far the longest lifespan and they are smallest in size and weight. Whenever you have a directly visible or reflected light source, you are faced with a problem of glare. The brighter and more concentrated the light is emitted, the higher the impact of glare. Physiologically, glare can range from being only a nuisance to being harmful to the eye. Glare causes visual discomfort by straining our visual cortex or causing visual disabilities like a temporal loss of vision. Opalescent translucent glass or plexiglass can help to reduce glare. Unfortunately, these materials also substantially reduce a lamp's total lumen output. In other words, they reduce its efficiency. Because of that, you should consider LED-specific diffusion materials that help you to balance glare reduction and light transmission in a most optimal fashion. Another issue that is often rather poorly addressed is that badly dimmed LEDs can flicker above but also below the human threshold of perception. You may not be able to see it is there, but it is. In lighting, flicker is understood as a rapid monotonic fluctuation of brightness. Think warning or strobe lights, only much faster. 
Flicker, like the effect of glare before, ranges from being irritating and fatiguing to posing a serious health risk, for example for people with migraine or epilepsy. Part 5. How do LEDs work and how do you select the components to drive them? LED is an acronym for Light Emitting Diode. A diode can be loosely understood as an electric one-way street, a tiny device that lets the current pass in only one direction. As Oleg Losev found out in 1927, an LED is an electroluminescent device. The power you put into an LED is converted into visible and invisible radiation, that means into light and heat. In other words, not all photons generated can escape the light emitting substance. Instead, they heat it. And this is why lighting LEDs require cooling, either passively with a heatsink, or actively with a combination of heatsink and fan, or even by liquid cooling. This graph shows you two things. LEDs behave just like semiconductors, that means that a small change in voltage results in a large change in current. In the example shown here, a voltage of 2.8 would see your LED remain off or lit only dimly, whereas a voltage of 3.2 would see it destroyed, as the current passing through it rises sharply. Because of the characteristics just shown, you shouldn't power lighting LEDs directly from a voltage source. You can use a resistor to limit the voltage, but this is not recommended. In the right example, you can see there are 3 volts to get rid of, so to speak, and a properly sized resistor would do just that. It would convert the extra voltage into heat. But here's the problem. If we power a lighting LED this way, almost an entire watt of power is wasted. So why not use a voltage source that matches exactly? The thing is, when lighting LEDs are powered directly from a matching voltage source, the setup is bound to fail by an effect known as thermal runaway. Here's what happens. Once powered, the LED starts to conduct and becomes warmer, and the current passing through it rises, and so the LED becomes even warmer, and the current rises even further as well, until the self-amplifying effect destroys it. The proper way to drive a lighting LED is from a constant current source power supply, a little electronic device that keeps the constant current under all conditions. Constant current sources come in many different types, in form of linear, step-up or step-down drivers, depending on input voltage available and output voltage required. In this final example, you have a constant current source that can deliver a constant current of 300 milliamperes at an output voltage between 2 and 40 volts. That means you can power between 1 and 4 LEDs that each require 9 volts input voltage at 300 milliamperes current. But there's a snag. Never put a switch on the secondary side, that means between LED and constant current source. The reason is that a constant current source without a load connected to it initially outputs the highest voltage it can. If you put a switch between the constant current source and a load, and then close the switch, you will likely destroy the load because it will immediately receive the full voltage. Constant current sources are also available with additional features like inputs for dimming, daisy chaining or remote control. As you saw earlier, an LED is the most efficient type of lamp currently available, but still, it only converts up to 25% of input power into light. The extra power is radiated as heat, which is why lighting LEDs require appropriate cooling as mentioned before, either passively with a heatsink or actively with an additional fan or even liquid cooling. Active cooling is complex and costly. You should try to solve LED cooling passively, or even with parts of the luminaire itself. The larger the surface area of a heatsink and the softer the metal it is made from, the more heat the LED can transfer to it, so the heatsink can then dissipate the heat to the surrounding air by convection. This is why aluminium is the lighting designer's preferred heatsink material. Aluminium is at the sweet spot of heat dissipation capacity and price. Also, you can easily cast, extrude or form it into all kinds of shapes, and you can anodize it, which improves the heatsink's durability and aesthetics. Nevertheless, for a heatsink to dissipate heat via convection, you must provide sufficient airflow inside the luminaire and consider its ambient temperature when in use. To select an appropriate heatsink, you need to find its thermal resistance value RH to keep your LED's temperature well under its maximum rating. 
You will find its maximum rating on the specification sheet provided by the LED's manufacturer. In many simple cases, you can approximate it reasonably well by calculation, but a CFD analysis or testing a prototype is always the best. To develop your design concepts, you can use the Excel spreadsheet heatsink calculator XLSX provided in the course folder on the shared drive. And now it's your turn. Thank you for watching and listening.